Thank you. Let me first thank the organizers for inviting me. It's, uh, I'm really honored to, to give a talk in a conference to celebrate Jean Bourguin's birthday. Um, so I've learned a lot from Bourguin's results, articles, and you will see from this talk, I mean, this is a, a kind of evidence on how much I learned from Bourguin's works. So um, the title is Super Approximation and its Applications. Uh, I will start with a very general setting of, um, of a general kind of question, and it is, it is a vague question on purpose. The question is, I start with a dense subgroup of a compact group. So G is a compact group. And gamma is a dense subgroup. And we ask ourselves, how dense is gamma? This is, this is a big question that we want to un un understand or formulate better. So how dense is gamma? So there are lots of questions like this. So the easiest example that you can think of is when G is a circle and you have irrational rotation. So then you want to understand how dense it is. It's precisely the Diophantine properties of the irrational rotation that you have. Um, but I'm more interested in the non-commutative setting. For instance, when you look at G, for, for instance, when G is SU2 or when G is SUN, any compact Lie group, or when G is SLN ZP for the thing of integers, periodic integers, or when G is product of a bunch of finite groups. So in any of these settings, this question makes sense and it's an interesting question. But first I have to say what, what do I mean by this? How dense is gamma? One way to approach this question is using random walk and this is the approach that I'm going to use in this talk. So one way to approach this question is saying, okay, so if my gamma is generated by a finite set omega, and in this talk all of my generators are supposed to be symmetric, when gamma is generated by omega, where omega is a finite symmetric set, and symmetric means any element, any inverse of an element of omega is also inside omega. Then I can consider the random walk with respect to omega inside G. So that means I start with a measure, with a probability measure on omega. And then start convolving it by itself and I want to understand what can I say about the probability law after L step, random walk. For instance, can we say that this guy converges to the Haar measure of the group itself? So what we, so what you know most likely is that we get the best understanding of this if we look at, okay, so let me actually give you, give you the notation first. So the L step random walk, you can get the probability law by convolving this measure by itself L times. Where as always, convolution of uh, two measures here, I'm assuming that support of both of them are, uh, is finite. So the convolution of two measures is just summation. So essentially the probability of reaching to G after random walk first with respect to nu and then mu, it means I have to first get to G1 or first get to G2 and then G1, where G1 times G2 is G. So this is the convolution and then uh, it's easy to see that this is in fact, uh, you can understand this using uh, the operator 
you only go from L2 of G to L2 of G, where this is essentially the averaging operator using mu. Or alternatively, I can say this is the convolution of the measure uh, with a function f. So then having this operator, when I want to understand the L-fold convolution, this means that I need to understand this guy raised to power L. So what can we say what, what this guy is? So as we know from linear algebra, we understand powers of a matrix the best when the matrix is of the diagonal form. And the point is that uh, so in, even if G is not finite in the compact case, still we do have spectral theory. And this is a self-adjoint operator, so I can use that. And um, so because T mu, okay, so T omega is a self-adjoint operator. And it's an averaging operator, so it's operator norm is at most one. And if I apply to the constant function, and because I assume G is compact, constant function is inside L2, so then uh, it's an averaging operator, it doesn't change. So the constant function is an eigenfunction of this operator with eigenvalue one. And essentially when we want to understand this guy, um, we get the best understanding of this power if we get lucky and in the orthogonal space, the operator norm is strictly less than one. In that scenario, when I raise it to power L, that part shrinks towards zero and I get converged and, and I, this guy converges to the projection to the constant function, which is exactly what we want to say that this converges to the power measure of G. In fact, in this scenario, we get an error term, an exponential error term. So um, here I started with a dense subgroup, but I could have said uh, um, gamma is any subgroup. And then I, I could have asked, I want to understand the distribution of gamma inside G. And this is the setting that I will choose. So I will cross out the this dense part and instead of saying how dense is gamma, I ask myself how is gamma distributed in G. Clearly, um, it, it, it is the same question, but I do it on purpose because it gives me a, b a bit of flexibility on, on the notation. So uh, clearly, uh, gamma is only distributed in the closure of gamma, which is going to be a compact set anyway. But it gives me, uh, so here is the reason that I gave it like that. So here is the definition. This notation, lambda of uh, omega inside G, this means the operator norm of T omega, but when I view it on L2 of the closure of gamma curve. So this means I'm, I look at L2 of the closure of gamma, and then I look at orthogonal to the constant function. Okay. So we get the best understanding of the random walk when this is a strictly less than one. Okay. In, that in that scenario, I say omega has, ran has a spectral gap, or I say the action of gamma has a spectral gap. So this is in, so if this is a strictly less than one, we say, so it's better to say the action of this guy on gamma bar, but on purpose I say G has a spectral gap. I say this has That's a good idea. So I'm going to continue down here. So it's it. Okay. 
An alternative way of thinking about this is saying that, um, alternatively, it's the same as saying that a function which is perpendicular to the constant function cannot be invariant, almost invariant, under elements of omega. Or I can say it in this form, that for every, so alternatively, So the action of gamma and G has a spectral gap. If for every function in L2 of gamma bar, perb, you have that at least one of the elements should move it away from itself. You have that uh, Maxim maximum of the elements inside omega, the L2 norm as S acts on F minus F should be more than some constant times F. Okay. So alternatively, I should say that there exists delta naught positive such that for every function in this space, one of the omega elements should move it away. Uh, say it again. So this is the closure of gamma inside G. And then I look at, um, inside this space, I look at the, those functions that are perpendicular to the constant function. And then in this space, I want to say that at least one of the elements inside omega should move it away. Is it, is it okay? No, so the point is that we do not have anything invariant under gamma. So we are looking at the function, I, I mean, so if something is invariant under gamma, then it's going to be constant inside L2 of gamma bar because gamma is dense inside gamma bar. My functions are inside gamma bar, yeah? So I look at the functions on gamma bar and then, is that a question? Okay, so this is um, roughly says that we do not have almost invariant functions inside a gamma bar. Sometimes we make it more precise and we say there is no delta naught invariant, almost invariant functions. So, but let me use the loose way of saying it, no almost invariant functions. Okay, so when we have such a property, then we have a best understanding of the random walk, uh, and therefore we know how well we can approximate points inside G within gamma. But now the question is, do we have such groups? Um, the first way of creating such actions with a spectral gap is in a way, a, a cheating way. We start with a group so-called Tajdan, so if gamma has Tajdan property T, then this would have that property. I mean, what, what is that? So it says, we say gamma has property T, if not only this particular unitary representation of gamma has no almost invariant function, but in fact, any unitary representation with no fixed point has no almost invariant function. So, so I mean, it's a cheating way of saying <laughs> we have such an action, but let me just write down. So this IE, this means that um, there exists some constant such that for every unitary action, any unitary representation with no non-zero with uh, fixed points being zero, there is no delta naught 
almost invariant vector. Okay, so now you can say, do we have such a thing? And the answer is yes. Khajdan, when he introduced this, he also proved that um, if gamma, example, if gamma is a lattice in a um, higher rank, means a real rank at least two, simple Lie groups, then gamma has T as property T. So again, maybe you don't know what that is. You can think about, so two examples I would mention. One of them is SLNZ. This is a lattice inside SLNR, and if R, if N is at least three, then this is going to have at least, I mean, rank at least two. So this, this has property T. And another example that you can think of is, uh, uh, think about the quadratic form with five variables. So this is x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared minus root 2 x4 squared minus root 2 x5 squared. And then, uh, okay, so I'm gonna continue the other side. And then look at the orthogonal group associated to this quadratic form. And let gamma be SO of this uh, quadratic form. This is not a number, this is this quadratic form and plug in zero two. So this can be viewed as if you plug in the real points, you get a signature three, two, and then the rank is two. So this is a simple group of rank two. So again, this guy is going to have property T. Okay, but I mean, these are uh, the gamma, so how about G? I have to give you a compact group and let gamma sit inside that compact group. So in the first example, the G that you can take is SLN ZP. Okay, so then the SLN ZP is a compact group and SLN Z is a subgroup of that. So in the first example, SLN Z a group that has property T. Now, out of this discussion, we know that the action of this guy on the compact group SLN ZP has a spectral gap. And in the second case, what is the compact group that I can take? The compact group is using the Galois conjugation of the quadratic form. Essentially, I can take the Galois conjugate of Z root two and that guy is going to preserve the Galva conjugate of that guy, and that is SO5, which is a compact group. So that way I can embed uh, the second example, SO of that particular quadratic form, acts on S05, and this guy has a spectral gap. Okay, so nice, so now we have at least some examples. But I mean, these are cheating way of exa creating examples. I started with something where no matter what unitary representation you took, you are going to have uh, no almost invariant functions. So now can I create at least some examples where different phenomena happens if I change L to G to something else? And one such example is due to Selberg. 
Selberg's 3 over 16 theorem implies that if I look at the action of SLNZ, SL2Z, so SL2Z is uh, almost free group and free groups mapped out by uh, non-trivial abelian groups and it's not hard to see that abelian group because of the small rotations do have uh, Hilbert spaces with no fixed points but very small uh, invariant, I mean delta almost invariant functions. So SL2Z does not have property T but nevertheless if I look at SL2Z and then embed it diagonally in the product of SL2ZPs, what Selberg showed is that this guy has a spectral gap. I mean, he sh what he showed implies that this guy has a spectral gap. So as I said, this guy does not have property T, but nevertheless, I created a compact group and an embedding where the action does have a spectral gap. And, and as you can see, I mean, when all the primes are there, it should have connections with number theory and it does. So lots of work had been done in, in, on the subject. And now about arithmetic groups, we have a complete understanding of such actions due to work of lots of people. So again, uh, so and let me write down the theorem. So this is due to, um, again, Kaljan. Um, Selberg. Um, Holger Sarnak. Causal. Of Ulmo. So, what is the result? The result says that if I start with a, a semi simple group, algebraic group defined over Q, then I'm going to be a bit vague and uh, treat, treat it like a string. So, anyway, so imagine uh, z, of z joint with 1 over q not points of this, then I can embed this into the product of g z p s where p doesn't divide q naught. And the result of these people tells us that this action has a spectral gap. So now, again, in higher rank, uh, so if all the if all the factors are higher rank, it's due to Kajdan. For SL2, it's uh, and division algebras, it's due to Selberg. Burger Sarnak produces a kind of reduction to 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 show that it's enough to have a copy of SL2 or a division algebra inside. Closal deal dealt with the unitary case, and this is to add the Q naught and show that the technique can be extended to other places. So now we have a example where it, this guy does not necessarily have property T, but nevertheless we do have spectral gap. But again, it, this is uh, too much. We, have, we are asking too much about the group. It's not like you're starting with a compact group and then asking yourself under what condition you can understand the distribution of the group. So in this direction, this is exactly what we ask, um, what, what, we, what is called super approximation or sometimes super strong approximation. I like super approximation a bit better <coughs> because it is about approximating one. But I will say the connection with, with uh, super strong, approxi I mean strong approximation. Um, okay, so now the framework of super approximation is this, and this is a, let me, okay, so let me first say the framework and then mention the main conjecture. The framework is this, that I start with uh, gamma, which is a finitely generated subgroup of GL and Q. And because it's finitely generated, it's essentially joint Z joint with one over Q naught. So I start with such a finitely generated group. 
And then I look at the action of this guy on the product of GLN ZPs, where P doesn't divide Q naught. And I ask myself, under what condition this action has a spectral gap? Again, uh, remember that I'm using this convention that when I ask for a spectral gap, this means a spectral gap on the closure. So the question is, under what condition, under what conditions uh, it has a spectral gap? It has a spectral gap. So this kind of question is, is called super approximation. Okay, but I mean, if I want to understand it, I need to understand a little bit at least about the closure of this gamma. What can I say about the closure of this gamma? And the statement of strong approximation says that under certain algebraic conditions of the Zariski closure, the closure of this gamma is actually open inside the um, corresponding Zariski closure. So let me just write down what I just said without writing the conditions where under which you get uh, a strong approximation. So a strong approximation implies that under certain algebraic conditions, the closure of gamma here is dictated by the Zariski closure of gamma. This is what a strong approximation says. So under certain algebraic conditions, the closure of gamma is open in the product of GZPs. But I mean, what I want to take out of this is not the statement, but rather the philosophy. The philosophy says that in order to understand the closure, it's enough to understand the kind of polynomial equations that gamma satisfy. Okay, now, what super, strong, what super strong approximation or super approximation asks is that not only the closure can be dictated by polynomials, but in fact, the analytic behavior is also dictated by the polynomials. So that is, what super approximation is called. So meaning this condition is something about the Zariski closure. And here is the explicit conjecture of myself and Peter Weyer. Uh, this form is first written here, I mean some people Okay, so, so what is the conjecture? The conjecture says that um, this action has a spectral gap if and only if when you look at the Zariski closure, if you look at the connected component, this guy is perfect. So again, where G is the Zariski closure in GLN viewed as an algebraic group over Q. Okay, so this is the super approximation conjecture, the main conjecture. Now what do we know about it? And at this point, I have to apologize from lots of people who has contributed a lot to this subject. I have to cherry pick the results. I mean, there had been lots of results in this direction. I have to cherry pick in order to put it on in the time. Okay. So the, be the, the best results that we have in this direction, so one of the best results is due to Burgan and Barrio. So, Bjorn, Bjorn. They 
say that if I start with gamma inside SLN Z, and I ask for gamma to be Zariski dense, SLM, then this guy does have a spectral gap. The other result that we do have in this direction, more or less, is, is the following. So if we do not actually allow the entire p addicts, but let's cut it off from some stage. Let's cut it from p to the n. So let's make a bound for the powers of p then the answer is no, and th this, is, this is the truth. So the action of gamma on product of SL GLN Z mod out by P to the M naught Z has a spectral gap. If and only if the connected component of G is perfect. The case M equals M not equals to one is what uh, Peter Vario and, and I did. But the general M not is not much harder. So you need a little bit more work. The M not equals to one had applications in affine C, but I don't have time to go into it. So using that, Peter Sarnak and I managed to do uh, the main result in a fine C. Another application, I mean, another result that we know toward this conjecture is the following uniform spectral gap over ZPs. So, of course, when this guy has a spectral gap, all the, I mean, the action of gamma on any quotient of this space is going to have a spectral gap, with the same gap. In particular, it's going to have gap on GL and ZPs and uniform bound for all of them. So now we do know that uniform bound exists. So we don't, we don't know the product, we don't know the gluing part, but so this part is, so in fact, again, the supremum of lambda, this, I mean, the spectral gap essentially of GL and ZPs over all the primes that do not divide to not is less than one if and only if this is perfect. In fact, I mean, this direction you need much less as I will write down a lemma, it's, it's an easy lemma, that you do not need this, the whole thing. It's enough to know that you do have a spectral gap along some sequence of integers that go to infinity that would automatically tell you that the connected con component of G should be perfect. So let me write down the lemma. And actually, I mean, the corollary of this is a, is a cute corollary of, uh, of the so-called one for all and all for one. So um, let me write down the lemma first. So if for some sequence of integers, the action of uh, gamma and GLN Z modeled by MIZ has a spectral gap, then the connected component is perfect. So a corollary of this is that if I do know a spectral gap for a single prime, then I know it for all the primes and uniform on all of them. So that would be 
a consequence of this, because if I know it for a single prime, then I know it for the powers of them, so then the connected component is perfect, so I do it, I do get a uniform, you know, so this is a one for all kind of statement that you get out of this result. So if this guy has a spectral gap for some prime, then for all of them you get a spectral gap. And uniform band. Of course the conjecture says that there are, we should get the spectral gap for the product. Okay, so uh, why should be interested in the spectral gap? Um, one of the applications of having a spectral gap in the periodic case is, one of the first applications is due to Margulis, where he observed that you can use this fact to construct explicit um, expanders. So, so it has applications to combinatorics. What are expanders? expanders I don't, I don't want to go to the details of the definition, but expanders uh, are essentially um, a family of sparse graphs that are highly connected. So in one application, due to Margulis, is that if, um, so what he showed that if, if gamma, sorry, so for the, okay, so let's say if gamma acts, so let me just look at the explicit case of uh, SLN Z or if gamma is a Zariski dense subgroup of SLN Z, then, um, okay, maybe it's better to just mention the result that is completely due to Margulis. So if gamma has property T, then if you look at the family of expanders, Cayley, Cayley graphs of gamma mod out by a finite normal sub, finite, normal subgroup, finite index, normal subgroup of gamma, this forms a family of expanders. In fact, what he proved is, uh, is a bit stronger than that. It essentially says that if if gamma is a dense subgroup of a profinite group, then you, when you look at the quotient of this profinite group, you, the Cayley graphs gives you a family of expanders. So again, in any case, a spectral gap has one application in combinatorics that gives you explicit construction of expanders. Now, another application of a spectral gap So this is in the uh, Piatic case. In the Archimedean case, it has an application toward one of those rich problem. One of those rich problem. So the problem is I give you a finitely additive measure on a sphere, on SN. On, so it's on the Lebesgue sets of SN. So U is a finitely additive measure on Lebesgue subsets.
Now, if nu is rotation invariant, can we conclude that nu is up to a scalar is the Lebesgue measure. So Rosenblatt actually showed that if, I, if you manage to find a gamma which acts on S O M plus one with a spectral gap, then the answer to this question is yes. He showed that it's enough to find gamma where this action is, has a spectral gap. general. And then the example that I mentioned at the beginning, SO5, so right after this, Margulis and Sullivan independently answered this when, okay, so as I said five, you can do it for larger as well. So that means they could answer this in the case of S4, Sn when n is at least four. Said so yes, where n is at least four, essentially using this kind of proof. Then for n equals to uh, one and two, so again, this is the case where you have a spectral gap and you have property T, but in those cases, you should use some gammas that do not have property T. And then Dreamfield used the Lin's result to deal with um, the smaller dimensions. But this technology is, until now, okay, so now you see the importance of having the spectral gap in the compact D group as well. finish the story and then go to the theory talk. Yeah. Let's take this. So now we have actually a much better result toward having such a spectral gap groups due to Bourgain and Gambord. So they showed that if you start with gamma inside, um, okay, so they dealt with SUM. Inside SUM, which is dense, and they put one extra condition that if you look at the adjoint action with respect to some bases, elements of gamma should, should be algebraic. So uh, add gamma have algebraic entries, has algebraic entries. Under these conditions, which is a fairly mild condition, which implies that this action has a spectral gap. This had been extended to all the compact uh, Lie groups, simple compact Lie groups by and Dussex and by uh, Benoit and Dussex. <coughs> so, <coughs> so, 
when did they restart? Okay, good. Thank you. So then Benoit and Jusak say generalize this to any compact simple DT. The same result holds. Okay, so now mm, you having the result that I mentioned in the periodic, one gets the same result in the periodic setting. So that would be another application of a spectral gamma in this case, that uh, the corollary of that result is the only So, okay, so let me make it a bit precise. Let G be a semi-simple periodic analytic group. Suppose gamma is a dense subgroup. Inside G. And suppose, suppose that, um, again, as gamma has algebraic entries, then the only finitely additive gamma invariant function. Okay, so here I'm not assuming that G is a compact group. So I'm cheating a little bit because I'm not explaining what is local spectral gap because I don't have time. Uh, there is a notion of local spectral gap that I defined with Juana and Botone. So this, this also worked just extends this kind of um, application to Banach-Rosewitz to the locally compact groups and not necessarily compact groups. So even if it's not compact, it's still true that the only finitely additive gamma invariant um, measure. And okay, so I now I have to make a, I cannot work with all the subsets of G because I didn't assume it's compact. So the C CG is the set of uh, subsets of G whose closure is compact and Lebesgue. So, and this, so uh, those Lebesgue subsets with compact closure. So the only such finitely additive gamma invariant measure is the Haar measure. Up to scale. This is another application of the spectral gap of this kind of result. Another application is to the formation of Galois representations. So here is this application. Essentially, I'm using ideas of Ellenberg, using ideas of Ellenberg, Hall, and Kowalski. Unfortunately, I cannot get a new, a new result, but I can reprove a result, a recent result by, um, by Tamagawa and, yeah, I, uh, so I reproved the theorem of Kadore and Tamagawa. So what is the result? So the setting, it takes a bit time and I think I have enough time. So let A be an algebraic family of uh, abelian varieties. So A, so C is a curve, smooth curve, 
and this is a C um, abelian scheme with the family of algebraic uh, variety uh, of abelian varieties. C is a curve, is an algebraic curve, a smooth algebraic curve. And suppose that C is defined over, so you can assume K is uh, a number field, but it can be a finitely generated field. So where this is, a, okay, so let's say it's a number field. Now, the general philosophy, okay, so now for every point inside this curve, for every t inside the algebraic closure of this curve, if I look at the fiber, I get an algebraic, I get an abelian variety that's denoted by a sub t. So this is going to be an abelian variety defined over the residue field of this guy. Now I can form the Tate module out of them. And the absolute Galois group acts on the Tate module. So I get a Galois representation. So let rho sub P L be the Galois representation of the absolute Galois group. Okay, this is, I'm assuming T is algebraic. And this is the inverse limit of the torsion points. And this is essentially GL2, let's say this, this has dimension D, 2D ZL. Okay, so now, the general question is, how large is the Galois image? And the philosophy is that uh, in, in, the, in the generic point, the image of the generic monodromic group should be inside this for most of the points. Okay, so let's make it precise. So we have this monodromic group as well. So let's fix a point inside the complex points of this curve. So we have pi one of the complex point of this curve, some algebraic point. So this guy acts on the automorphisms of A, and that gives us a map, let's call it rho, to GL2Z, GL2DZ. Let's call the image of this guy gamma. Okay. So now, again, the philosophy is that typically for, for most of the t's, if, the, if I have a bound for the degree of kt, then image of this guy should contain a large portion of image of that guy. Okay. So let gamma be this guy. Okay, so now, uh, let's make that precise. So for every, I, I'm going to fix the degree of the residue field. So for every D, D is supposed, no, okay, I have already D. So let's call it M. N is supposed to be a bound for the degree of the residue field. So I look at all the points inside the curve. And then I look at the index of, okay, let gamma L be the closure, be the closure of gamma in GL2 DZL. Okay, so a large portion of this 
should be inside the image of this. Okay, large portion means if, the, if this index is less than n, okay, if the index is more than n, then this shouldn't happen frequently. For any small n, there exists a capital N such that the set of the points where this happens and the dimension of the residue field is at most a small m is finite. This is the theorem of Kadori and Tamagawa. But using spectral gap, one can get an easier proof. Okay, so this is another application of this kind of result. The, the other application, the last application that I'm going to mention is to orbit equivalence rigidity. So what is it? Suppose that I have a G and suppose it's a, a simple periodic analytic group. And suppose that I have gamma, which is dense inside G. And again, under this uh, extra annoying condition that add gamma as algebraic entries, Now, the point is that under these conditions, the orbits, I mean, the orbits of gamma and, and the action of gamma and G is orbit equivalent rigid. So what does that mean? I mean, roughly. So here is the result. If H is a profinite group, Lambda is a dense subgroup of H. If I know that the action of gamma on G is orbit equivalent to the action of lambda on H. So this essentially means that I have a um, Borel isomorphism between G and H, which can be descended to the quotient of G by my gamma and H by lambda. So I can go to the quotient space here by a measurable set and inverse is also measurable. So if I, these guys are orbit equivalent, this is a fairly weak condition. But uh, under these conditions, we, we will see that it's not quite weak. So there exists G naught, an open compact subgroup of G. and H naught, an open compact subgroup of H. And a group of isomorphism between the intersection of gamma intersected with these guys. So essentially, this would imply that these guys locally are the same. And there exists a theta from the intersection of this isomorphic to this. In particular, H should be periodic analytic. Oh, so uh, there exists a theta. Okay, so uh, there exists theta that sends G naught to H naught and theta of this. Okay, so I, I stop at this point. 